shape or form. Uh, now I'm thrilled to announce Tony UV, who I've known for years. He's a longtime contributor and OWASP member. He's going to be talking about building valid threat libraries for cloud-based applications. So let's give it up for Tony. All right, mic check. All right, cool. Hey, everybody. Thanks and welcome uh, for welcoming me to London and pleasure to be here. Sorry that we started a little bit late. Dive right into things. Um, I want to go ahead and just cover what the objectives are of this talk. Um, yeah, the main thing is that, you know, th this talk is, is, is kind of multifaceted and there's really too much to cover within 45 minutes. Um, what I try to do is basically build a case study uh, ta tailored towards the energy sector, oil and gas specifically, where cloud adoption is now resurging for various business reasons. And so I thought it'd be an opportune time to talk about, you know, exploring some of the, the threat, uh, building a threat library for that sector. Um, as well as seeing how building a threat library can actually help facilitate automation in DevSecOps. So, you know, obviously that, that's a lot to cover right there. I mean, just the case study alone is, is, is enough, is a mouthful. Um, you know, what we're going to try to do here is to exemplify a threat library uh, and, and, and basically show how we can build some context into the application, uh, in, into a cloud application that I basically uh, am, am using as a uh, guinea pig. Uh, it's actually a real application for a multinational company that is uh, one of the largest producers of, of oil um, and, and research uh, and exporters of oil in the world. Um, secondary goal here is that, you know, I want to demonstrate the main point here is that a true threat library can actually help to be the cornerstone to marrying that to attacks vulnerabilities. You know, there's attack libraries that exist, like KPEC and vulnerabilities and weaknesses that exist, lists that exist. Obviously, CVEs in the hundreds of thousands, CWEs in the hundreds and growing. And obviously, you're affected components of an attack surface. So the, the idea here is that with a threat library, if you're in DevSecOps and you're like me and you want to do some automation because you're tired of this kind of stagnant uh, security industry going nowhere, you want to be able to facilitate a lot of things. Um, and, and a threat context provides multiple different benefits. We'll get into that in a second. Lastly. Um, you know, looking at this diagram here uh, of, of DevSecOps, you know, there's, there, there's things that are happening when you're planning and you're coding and you're building, et cetera, and you're doing all the operational and development activities. There's opportunities for you from a security context to understand what sort of security inputs do you need to go into this process. And with today's CSPs, cloud service providers, and their related products, there's a multitude of uh, different web-enabled uh, interfaces that you can query and that you can actually um, uh, set settings for in, in your respective cloud application. A little bit about myself, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of details other than the things that you, you see here, but the reason I, I really show this, and, and by the way, my contact information is there mostly for feedback. I'm really interested for your feedback, things that you would like to see further evolved in this talk. Um, it, it's just 45 minutes, we'll love to make this a two hour thing and, and just kind of uh, add more to it. But, you know, I've done a lot of things over 25 years, and the benefit of starting out in IT is understanding process and understanding different systems, um, you know, different types of uh, workflows, both within multinational companies and startups. Um, I'll just use one of the things that's not on here is that actually was one of the first speakers at the SCAP conference in Baltimore. Um, and SCAP, for those of you that don't know it, I'll talk about that at the end, is a security content automation protocol. It was a wishful thinking for some level of security automation that never really happened, and there's different causal factors for that. But, you know, here in 2018, here we are. And I, you know, for, for me, I want to kind of highlight one of the biggest things with the smiley face is that I would love to bankrupt our own industry with some automation, um, just so that we can move on to some bigger and better things. And I, I think it's timely. I think we can do it, and I think that we'll soon get there. Um, but, 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 but uh, before we you know, dive into threat libraries, I want to be clear the air a little bit on some threat considerations and misinterpretations. I have some quotes up here that I think are pretty good takeaways. Um, if you get a copy of the stack, I think that they're pretty good um, words to live by uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, applying threat libraries or threat modeling to cloud. So um, just you know, let me start with a problem statement. And, and some of this that I might say might be heretical. Um, again, we're, we're, t we're, t we're talking about threat libraries. Obviously, threat libraries feed threat models uh, specific to cloud. But there's some clarifications that we need to, to, to do when we talk about uh, threat modeling activities. Um, there's this notion that oftentimes 
you know, that vulnerabilities you know, equal threats. And, and that actually a data flow diagram is in and of itself a, a, a threat model. And that's absolutely incorrect. There are artifacts that support a threat model, but they're, they're not in and of itself the entirety of one. Um, the reason I bring this up is because you know, there's, there's a lack of understanding in terms of what is a threat. Um, and the simplest way to really define it and really in any English dictionary that you wish to, to, to use is one that is a possible of a menace, right? You know, uh, you sometimes hear in the weather that says, you know, the, the storm, the sky is threatening for with showers today. There's always this underlying theme of like a possibility. Versus attack, it's something that actually happened. You know, today in you know Baghdad, there was missiles that came in. So and so city was attacked or whatever. Um, th th there is an absoluteness to an attack, and so th this is important when you're building a threat library is to be able to understand what where you're going to get your information. Where are you going to harvest your threat intel from the outside, right? Uh, where wh who are you going to listen to for outside intelligence that's really threat, and how are you going to harvest your own data? Um, AWS and Azure both provide, you know, a centralized dashboard of security threats. Uh, I just looked at the new uh, Azure uh, security dashboard, now called Hybrid, and it has a lot of bells and whistles. It has a lot of automation and workflow capabilities, and it has a threat uh, 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 component as well. Buyer beware with a lot of the threat plugins that is in your CSP, your favorite CSP um, dashboard or whatnot, because a lot of the threat intel that's going in there is being fed by security vendors. And not to really basically dismiss a lot of the security vendors that are out there, but again, they're providing uh, some of these you know, formulas, formulas that really violate the definition of a threat. Um, so a proposed resolution is that while you're considering and building a threat library for your cloud application, you know, consider some of the following. Um, sometimes that uh, the industry threat perspective, like we're going to talk about oil and gas. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, energy. There's a lot of experts in that field. There's, there's been crimes that predate, you know, information security. So there's, uh, there, that's a competitive market. You know, you're talking about millions of dollars a day. So there's more than enough incentive to do fraudulent or competitive behavior. So there, you begin there. Begin with the industry experts to understand the field. Um, the, the secondary thing is the, if you're building a, let's say we're all building a cloud application for a refinery or a company that is doing R&D for new development of oil wells, uh, you want to be able to mine a lot of data, right? Because the future of the energy sector and the reason that energy is really going to the cloud is to mine that data so they don't have engineers having to carry around laptops and, and interface with sensors and PLCs and stuff like that in order to get data and then you know, aggregate it somewhere else. The automation is here is, is basically beckoning major players from Shell, Exxon, et cetera, to be able to go to the cloud and use the computational power there. The other thing too is um, you know, the, for, for this exercise, a security champion conducting threat modeling you know, at the very end of this, this, uh, this, this talk, I will give a kind of a psychological profile of the ideal individual to really aggregate different key facets to really pull together what is good threat intel from the outside and what is good threat data that your cloud platforms and your own applications are actually harvesting if you're doing the proper level of logging. All right, so further clarifying on terms, uh, I just want to be able to say, you know, this, this castle being depicted Threat modeling is a model of threats. You know, there's, I'm always interested to see you know, um, that you know, threat modeling gets so convoluted into complex definitions. It's, it's a model of threats, as, as the name implies. And it, has, it predates all of our industry roots. It's always been a model of threats. And so what we're doing here today is trying to model the full cloud stack. You, know, you have cloud management APIs that, that affect the security of your infrastructure. IAM policies, access control policies, ACLs at the network level, architecture, DNS, all those things are beyond your VMs and so forth. So unlike other types of threat modeling approaches, we have to really consider the full stack. Um, I already talked about some of this other stuff here. You know, the, the um, threats are often inferred from attack surfaces. And security professionals sometimes like to do this where they basically let the asset, the information asset or the technical asset be they're, they're basically the reason for uh, uh, applying a threat. 
without actually understanding a threat motive and a threat actor and, and so forth. Um, the, what we're, the main point here is that fourth bullet point that is going to be kind of a theme to this whole talk, is how can we take a threat library and correlate it to a good attack pattern to, to exemplify viability of attacks against a cloud application? That's going to be, I have actually some um, you know, personal uh, experience in federal in the United States uh, with this, where you know, I've worked a lot with MITRE over the years. The guys there have done CVE and, and, and attack now with the post-exploitation framework and whatnot. And uh, what's, what's, what's great about some of the things that came out of Styx and Taxi that's now adopted by Oasis and not MITRE anymore is the fact that there was a schema right, that had indicators of compromise and threat campaigns and stuff like that. But what was missing from that great schema was the ability to marry that to a KPEG or to a CVE. Um, over the year, uh, since Oasis took over, what, what happened was is that the KPEG identifier got deprecated. And so you basically have you know, this sticks and taxi protocol to be able to share threat intel right, in a standardized fashion, um, to be able to create uh, 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 you know, some, some uh, resounding threat evidence um, but you couldn't really marry it back to your attacks that you wanted to maybe exercise in your automation and, as terms of uh, uh, security testing. These are all things that are extremely important. And this is why my, my um, colleague of mine in, uh, in OWASP developed uh, uh, the, the PASTA framework many years ago. Um, and we're, we're only going to talk about really a tiny fragment of stage four. This is the PASTA framework. It's a linear process meant to be collaborative amongst architects and developers. And we're going to talk about how the threat analysis is really one of the key cornerstones to a great threat model. Now, one of the things that will, you know, and I took this actually from the book. In the book, I talk about different maturity levels when you're doing threat modeling. We're going to focus on an intermediary step of evidence-driven threat models. Uh, the goal here for us is to build a threat library that's supported by evidence, supported by actual you know, socioeconomic evidence, um, uh, evidence within the field and industry that we'll cover of the energy sector, evidence of provided by vulnerability data, uh, threat actors, et cetera. Um, again, this particular model is it's interesting because in 2015, we published the book with Wiley Life Sciences. And in 2016, six months later, um, this particular research come out, it came out, and it was interesting, and I won't get all into you know, the details. You guys can read this on your own. I want you to focus your attention on, you know, this was really covering, uh, this was from Carnegie Mellon, and they were doing uh, coverage on different TMMs, threat modeling methodologies, and they cover this persona non grata. I don't know why, okay. So um, the persona non grata basically says, listen, let's have more of an attacker-centric model for threat modeling. And that's exactly what PASTA is. It's the process for attack simulation. Let's get into a criminal mindset. Let's not be security professionals. Black hat's too soft of a word. Let's actually truly try to emulate the threat motives, the, the, the actual means and ways and techniques across the full stack, including human vectors, for um, you know, hitting our targets. And so um, what was interesting with this research that was done is that the PNG model basically had the least false positives, and it basically had the most consistent threats identified across multiple teams using different methodologies. So, you know, this, this is interesting because it's, it basically supports a PASTA framework for a risk-centric approach. It's linear, um, it's evidence-driven, it's attacker simulation. Uh, this RACI model is just simply trying to depict all the different cross-section of people that could be involved um, but let's, let's close this out by basically you know, taking away some key points as we wrap up this first section to this presentation, is learn to substantiate your model. Um, you know, FUD perceptions do not constitute valid threat patterns. Uh, it's important to contextualize your abuse of your cloud applications with the right uh, threat intel. And let me just say, oftentimes in security conferences, there's always a talk about problems messaging vertically up. You know. As security professionals, we can message fairly well horizontally with other engineers or with maybe at, you know, a CISO or a, a security champion. But understanding threats is a universal um, uh, piece of information that messages really well. 
and it could substantiate so many different things. Um, funding, uh, you know, uh, legitimacy for remediation, even from the naysayers that we commonly face within our environments. So the role of the threat library is intended to provide a living body of content around viable threats. And with DevSecOps, we have the opportunity now to feed that threat library consistently with more learning. So if, if you think about, you know, in the monitor and operational phase of our DevSecOps lifecycle that we showed before, there's events that are happening within our system, our application, our frameworks that we're using, and we're we want to log those things. Now, that's a lot of information. And it, the, the key thing is, is what to log and marrying that back into a threat library. Uh, just to close this out, um, you know, this section. Now, here's an example. I was looking at CSO. CSO, you know, I enjoy their articles. Uh, they have, uh, you know, the Dirty Dozen, 12, 12 top cloud security threats. I took a look at this because I was like, wow, maybe they'll talk about some of the things that I'm already finding here. But, you know, as, as, um, as I saw, the, the, really the article basically just showed a lot of vulnerability or post-incident related information. It's really not threats. And so why is that important? Because uh, the threat messaging, first of all, the threat piece of information will correlate to an attack pattern. So uh, data breaches is too broad. Insufficient identity, credential, and access management, that's a vulnerability. Insecure interfaces and application programming interfaces, that, that's a vulnerability. This goes back to what I opened up with, that the you know, inferring that a vulnerability automatically applies an automatic threat is logically erroneous. It doesn't even marry to our, you know, our, our, our um, non-technical areas of our lives, you know, if you apply this on a personal level. So the, the reason that I bring this up is so that we can basically build a better threat library, and we're gonna explore this um, now in looking at um, threat modeling um, with uh, some integration with Dev, DevOps in the energy sector. So let's build some background to what we're looking at here. So uh, the energy sector is riddled with a lot of players, and increasingly so. You know, obviously dwindling resources, uh, the, the exploration for gas and oil has you know, been, been happening for, for decades. So there, there's a competitive market for first to market on finding new sources of, of, of crude oil. Traditional threats have encompassed you know, piracy, you know, um, pirates stealing, you know, uh, uh, wrecking ships and attacking ships for, 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 their, for their oil. Terrorism, insurgency, organized crime, civil protests. So right there, we're legitimizing. They're, they're, before we get into the cyber aspect of things, before we get into interconnected web-enabled PLCs and SCADA systems and, and, and ICS controllers and stuff like that, we already have motive. We already have crime in the making for years. And so um, there's, there's definitely motive and, and there's means. Now, with the facility of web-enabled protocols and, and cloud service providers, we, we, we have some opportunities. Again, let's, let's take on the adversarial approach and not the white hat approach right now. Let's think about how we can benefit from some levels of s sabotage or uh, res uh, data tainting, and we'll get into some of that in a second. So it's a highly competitive, capital-intensive industry. Um, you know, some of the, the in, in building a small, you know, this is just a subset of the threat library that we'll look at, but the reason that a lot of these energy providers are going into the cloud today is because of the massive amounts of information that all of their operations is doing. From the R&D aspect to the well refineries to, you know, um, finding new downspouts and, and uh, performance of their equipment, all that is data. And now they're eager to get to the cloud. So. What I did is I found a, uh, a good guinea pig. Uh, Statoil, is there any Norwegian in the room? That makes you Norwegian in my book. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Statoil you know, now is Equinor. And uh, so basically they, they, uh, they teamed up with a uh, company that basically developed a, uh, a cloud so the, so the far left one basically says, Satoll's trouble for you move to the cloud. Um, that company there, Force Subsea, I don't know if you guys can see that, they basically are a Swedish company, 
and they developed a, a platform for managing well spots. Now, uh, for, I'm sorry, for, for man managing well heads. The application's name is Wellspot, and basically it runs in Azure. Okay, so um, basically they provide this multi-tenant login, FlexTrack multi-tenant energy app is, is that in the middle. And uh, you, know, you just put in really the domain, and basically it allows you to look at what different forms of authentication in that far right that uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can basically try to, uh, try to kind of highlight it there a little bit higher. But there's multiple forms of authentication, integrated authentication with, with, uh, with Active Directory, Azure AD, uh, YubiKey, uh, SMS even. And so, you know, when we, let's, let's stop to think about a little bit about what could be our threat motives. So Statoil, if you know a little bit about them, they have been um, declining in their fines for good crude oil, but their actual production has increased, which just makes them a lot more efficient for what they have. But they're relying on data now. They're relying on data in order to see how well they're doing and performing. They're also a public company, as my man over here has noted that they, uh, he bought some stock. Um, let's look at what I like. Uh, this, is a th this is a threat model card that I like to give certain clients for an application or even an organization. One of the things that you know, um, I like to do off, oftentimes with my team is organizational threat models, but we won't get into that. But if you look at the threat library here that's established, you'll notice that it's pretty small. You know, a threat library should be pretty manageable, and it basically should basically uh, denote some level of, of uh, menace to a target for some level of, of, of profit. Um, there are some things that are basically italicized because it doesn't matter if you're in e-commerce, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a church organization, if you're higher education, you're going to face some of these threats, right? Um, crypto jacking now is the new formal term. Uh, um, the uh, extortion, you know, is is a is, is a gold mine in, in any in any field. So you have some some consistent threats that should be part of every threat library. But then you have some things that you know are related to like things like sabotage. Um, where sabotage could be sanctioned by you know, corporate, corporate uh, adversaries um, that basically want to be able to throw, throw you off your, your, uh, your, your data mining game for um, competitive advantages. Um, tainting data. Uh, tainting data being reported back can happen in multiple different ways. And basically, it affects the accuracy in reporting. There was a, a number that was pretty astonishing that uh, Statoil shared in an article that related to uh, an amount of $750,000 a day is basically lost if there's inaccuracies in some of the data inconsistencies that they have in the field. And if you look at just, we're not talking about all the different aspects of, of, of um, you know, oil and gas, but just in managing their, uh, their, their, their well, well spots, um, we, we have an enormous amount of equipment that is you know, tied together and interfacing now to this platform. So a lot of the data of how their sensors are performing, how much, uh, uh, how much, uh, how many, how much metrics or uh, crude is actually being discovered, uh, the type and the quality, all of these things are being reported back. And like I said before, there's some incentive for hijacking a lot of that data. The, the main um, theme, if you think about a CIA triad, it's not confidentiality, obviously. It's the integrity, and it's also the availability. Being down or having poor data will completely cost a company hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over a short, short, short period of time. What I've done here is I've established a threat library based upon a lot of the research that I did, and I'll get to the research sources towards the end of the talk, but I married it to an attack surface of what I know of the application just from completely an OSINT model, and also attack patterns that you know, would basically undermine those, those, that, those attack surface components. And the associated threat matrix there is really intended to show um, where my threats are correlating to my attacks and to what components in my, in, my, in my attack surface. Now, where this gets interesting for DevSecOps is when we build out attack trees. And just in looking at one parent threat node, we look at the threat from the threat library of sabotage. Um, this one is related to an operational activity of 
uh, flaring alarm data. So maybe I want to sabotage and basically trigger some alarm uh, systems alarming in order to stop production. You know, there's obviously you can imagine there's a lot of regulatory and safety measures that have to be abided by. So when things alarm, stop production affects you know production and, and availability. So I can't see this as good as you guys can see it, but um, and I won't go through all the different branches here. But um, this I, I like attack trees because they're visual. I also like attack trees because it shows the relationship between the parent node of a threat and the underlying attacks. And it could be a one-to-many relationship. Now, let's start to think like a pen tester now. Let's start to think about automation and testing. Anytime we have an, an, an attack pattern, we can maybe cross-reference it to a, a part in, in MITRE's attack library, KPEC. And we can start to feed our uh, testing engine with these types of uh, KPIC values, which are correlated to payloads. Um, there's a great open source tool that we've been using for a long time called vFeed. Uh, anyone use vFeed here? No? Uh, basically what it does is it basically takes all of your CVEs, it doesn't do it for CWEs yet, and it marries it automatically to your KPEX. And if you, you know, CVEs, they're literally like 700,000, I think, and then like, uh, you know, um, with the capex, I think it's just a couple hundred, and so it's you have a one-to-many relationship. But going through and doing searches, like I did, <laughs> in order to basically build this tree, is not automated. This is not where the DevSecOps part comes in. But if you have something, if if you basically have a threat library that you, if you build a threat model with a threat library, and it automatically can correlate to capex, you can start to have testing to the areas of your application that are most critical. The, going back to the threat card here, the idea is that when you sit down with product managers, project managers, senior management, they're going to get that. They're going to get that. They're not going to get KPEX. They're not going to get CVEs. They're not going to get the, the, you know, the, the, the CERT reports. They're going to be like, your 10 seconds of being in my face is over. But this makes sense. And when you can marry that all the way down to say, do you want this to happen? We found that we have evidence from energy sector uh, research groups, operational groups. Uh, there's uh, uh, some research that I pulled from the uh, European Council, which had a special uh, energy cyber security report. I also pulled evidence from the Department of Energy in the United States. They had their own uh, security report. And uh, all of these things substantiate the, the threat library. But as we go into you know, the threat of the attack tree, you know, we marry these capex, and, and I didn't do it for all of them, but I did do it for, this, for the vulnerabilities and weaknesses, is that you, you have now things to check. Um, I wish I could, I'm tempted to fast forward to uh, uh, one of the dashboards from Microsoft's really cool um, Azure hybrid platform, um, because there in the top right it says 24 like, million alerts. I think anybody that's been in operations, and I've been you know, in security operations in the dungeon, um, you, eyes on glass, looking at alerts. You know, now we got you know, SIMs and IDS, you know, different types of things feeding, you know, feeding something else that feeds something else that feeds something else. And we have a content problem. So the idea behind a threat library within a threat model is to provide some level of poignant uh, security focus so that you can test the things that are most concerning. It doesn't mean that you forego the rest of the, the things, but you begin by addressing the vulnerabilities that really affect the attacks that make that threat actually viable. Uh, the other thing, too, you know, before I close out this graph, is the, the last you know, kind of area here. So you know, these vulnerabilities are affecting components, right? So the, these are components. It could be server-side components. It could be frameworks. It could be third-party libraries, whatever is really in scope. But the, the, the good thing about it here is you have this last rung of what every developer wants to know. I was like, fine, I'm tired of you scaring me. Now tell me what to do about it. And so all of these different, uh, I put D for defense mechanisms, I, I, you know, really countermeasures, is intended so that you could actually, these marry to, um, parameters and API uh, checks in Azure, all of these do. So there's a way to automatically you know, query the uh, Azure interface. 
Um, you could also use the Azure agent if you're looking at a VM, but if you're looking at you know, network rules or policies or privileges, you can query all these things to see if you have actually have a problem, or you can actually do a put, HTTP put, in order to basically post a, uh, a control that, that basically mitigates uh, the attack patterns in the tree. The, you know, when I was, uh, one of the cool things that I think would be great, and if anyone wants to join me on this crazy mission, uh, I would love it, is to be, can you imagine if we have like a, a threat model schema standardized, you know? Uh, there's a standard schema, you know, it, it can basically marry the sticks. Um, you know, we basically get, we, we can pull threat intel from taxi services around the world. There's only like really 30 credible ones. And you can basically take that threat information to reinvigorate your threat model. But we need a schema. And I've been talking about that for a long time. And um, usually people ignore me, but one day. Um, I'm just going to show a couple of different you know, uh, script mapping countermeasures that can be automatically implemented. Uh, I only got a few minutes left, but you know, there was a vulnerability in my attack tree related to an exposed Redis cache server. So you know, uh, Redis caching system exposed erroneously. I'm trying to validate. So this is more of a detective control that I can do maybe during my, um, maybe, maybe during my, my build process, right? So in my, in my DevOps process, maybe I want to be able to validate and say that, OK, I actually have my uh, Redis uh, server configuration actually not exposed to the internet. Um, this is basically what the JSON actually looks like. You, know, you get basically a 200 you know, if everything checks out OK. Um, but what, what it's doing here is providing, you know, if, there wasn't, if it was completely exposed, you would have a start and end IP that would be null. Uh, but here we're basically assuring that there's a white list of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, of IPs that can only get to it, uh, which would be the inverse of what we have in our in our tree. Now, from a preventative check, you know, where we're actually wanting to change this up and do a put, we can basically do a we can change the configuration uh, if we don't have this control enabled based upon our attack tree, based upon our threat model, and we can basically say, well, we have this exposure. Let's architecturally, let's go ahead and close that gap. AWS is no different. You know, uh, you guys might be uh, definitely, I'm sure, using AWS. You know, the problem with AWS compared to Azure, in my opinion, is that the security products don't converge into one management, you know, dashboard as neatly. I mean, you have all these different fractured. You know, guard duty is great. You know, you have, um, you know, the firewall manager. Uh, you have the AWS WAF, uh, but Azure has this pretty cool all-in-one, all security in one place. It's really cool. This is what I was talking about before. You have that 21.4 million you know, alerts. And, and so th this is what I'm trying to kind of convey here. The, the, the traditional approach, and you know, we're, we're getting automation through cloud, right? We're getting web-enabled APIs that support JSON and other structured data in order to share information. That's great. Sharing information, but that's that is an expletive amount of information, right? That, that, that is, uh, that, that is non-operational. That is non-operational. But so the idea of if you overlay this great information, there's a lot of good information. This shows most attack resources. Um, you know, this has SEV levels, you know, nothing out of this world. Um, but if you overlay what you have here and you build workflows, which you can, uh, then you can basically, you can also customize your alerting based upon you know, what assets, what, what's in your attack surface. Or you can customize alerting based upon certain types of vulnerabilities uh, that, you, that you find. So I, you know, the, 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 uh, the focus versus traditional approach is simply trying to mitigate the things that matter faster. Uh, for the energy sector, um, you know, in, in, this, in this example with uh, four, uh, the, that, that Swedish company, the, the other concern here is, is that you know, this SaaS provider, really a SaaS provider for Statoil, and they're, you know, what makes, if, if we were all, you know, Statoil, what, what are we to think that they're doing a threat model-based approach or even looking at this for our application? You know, and that's the scary part, and this, that, that provides another element of, of, of concern there is the, the vendor risk aspect, right? is, is uh, the consideration is, is any of these alerts, because that dashboard is per tenant. So this only applies to 
Statoil, but if Statoil doesn't really have any insight to this and it's only managed by the, the third party, then you're going to have a loss of any sort of knowledge in terms of what are the types of alerts that you're actually seeing that are affecting your threat model. I'm going to close out and just simply say the, <clears throat> the future of your threat library and security automation you know, requires kind of a, a schizophrenic type of personality in security. I enjoy playing that role often. Um, you, know, you really kind of have to be a, a mashup of these, you know, these individuals. You, know, you have you know, the founders of Unix on one end really understanding technology. Uh, there, there's a lot of security professionals that you know, don't understand enough about emerging technologies, emerging frameworks. So that, that's, that's, that's crucial. Um, being able to th think like a criminal is, is probably even more important. I, I think that's a deficit. Um, it's important to think and understand what are the nefarious motives, and most important, what are the economic benefits of that nefarious motive? You know, we're not talking about script kitty stuff. We're talking about true operational um, hacking that gets us paid, um, where we can establish persistence, where we can basically you know, pass the hash and harvest credentials and, and, and compromise IPs and sell them and, and work for uh, country, nation states that are sanctioning all this stuff. And the last part is the global economic business hat. Um, I put my friend there, Warren Buffett, so that we can basically have, like going back to the oil industry, do we understand enough? You know, I, I think I put on here is that, that the business perspective really addresses the business threats and not necessarily the security threats. And oftentimes, when we want to look at you know, th threats, in, especially in the cloud, we think about you know, security threats. But we don't basically take the time to understand the threats to the business, which is where our threat models should begin from a risk centric standpoint. These are some of the uh, threat libraries that, are, that I found very useful. Um, from a, I, I did want to cover the transportation sector, uh, but this was way too short of a talk in order to do that. Um, but uh, there's a couple of great resources there. there there's a lot of these ISACs. You know, I, I give most of the ISACs a C minus, except for the financial one. Um, most of them really don't have a good uh, information of indicators of compromise. Um, when working with the FBI, as an example, or the local state Bureau of Investigations or Secret Service in the United States, most of the time they, they don't care about what's happening with you and your organization. They just want to solve their cases. So if you have information to help their cases, then they'll share information. So you know, the, um, the ISEX, I gave about a C minus. The, the industry sector reports are extremely good. Um, you know, sometimes I would, uh, I would remember I was in Eastern Europe one time and I was doing, I was trying to get intel for uh, a socially depressed uh, area, economic recessed area in, in, uh, in that part of the world and how that can correlate to different types of cybercrime. And I got some really good evidence from, you know, state officials, uh, your, um, Interpol uh, reports and stuff like that. So. They're, they're, they're not that as hard as you, you might think to get. Um, you just ha simply have to have uh, the right connections, but they, they're, they're an A-plus definitely in terms of having really good threat intel. Now, comparatively speaking, you know, there's, there's, there's companies that advertise threat intel to, to build your threat library, but the best ones is if you can basically do these you know, four things. Twitter, Google, phenomenal. I mean, if you can build your own bot using Slack and Teams and and uh, different, even simple RSS feeds, I found those to be even sometimes more helpful than some of the OTX feeds that, for example, Alien Vault sometimes shares, not to discredit some of the things that they're doing. Um, also, industry leaders like GE and Data Command, they speak at length about their devices in the energy sector. They talk about, and, and if someone that is not in the energy sector, I want to know how does your sensor work. I want to know what protocols does it use. I want to know if it uses IoT protocols. It, you know, does it use um, what non-standard ports is it using? What non-standard you know calls is it using? You know, are they, you know, are they how are how are they falling into my CRUD model? Create, read, update, delete. If I have information about the manufacturer or OEM details about the, uh, their their systems and understand their use cases, I'll be in a better position to to build a, a real threat model. Uh, lastly, this is my last slide here. You know, looking forward, um, you know, a lot of people look to organizations like MITRE, you know, and I'll go back to my story where I was one of the uh, speak first speakers talking about the SCAP conference in Baltimore. And uh, SCAP is still around. It, it's still 1.3 or something like that. And this is going back, you know, almost 10 years. 
So 1.3, 10 years. So my, 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 my thing to you is don't hold your breath for security automation to come at the hands of, of some sort of you know, standard body. We, we, we are the ones, you know, maybe through the, the, the conduit of OWASP and other uh, organizations like it, to create that level of ingenuity where we can create the right schema, where we can create maybe like a body of threat vignettes that you know, retail, e-commerce, higher education, government, in different facets of our businesses around the world can actually use and benefit. Um, ultimately, there is a, an enormous opportunity. I mean, even right now, with you know the, some of the, the the examples I showed with uh, Azure and the uh, Expose APIs, they have reference sheets for showing what is exposed, what parameters that does it need in terms of post, get, put requests, what, that you need to pass it in order so that you can check whether or not that control exists within your cloud application. So. The ability to do some of the things that you know, I've done as part of this presentation, which didn't take a lot of time, is, is something that you, you know, everyone can really do for their own respective cloud applications. If you do have any further questions, uh, or if you have some ideas that you know, ha were triggered from this talk, would love to talk to you afterwards, or you can hit me up at any one of these mediums. So appreciate your time, and thanks for having me.